What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Hot Scum. That's right. This right here is the podcast where we get down to the brass tacks, where we dive into the deepest, darkest, murkiest waters. That's right. This is Pod Scum. And I am, of course, your host, Rex Ruger. That's Rex with three X's. I count them a one, a two, a three. You might also know me as AKA the King of Sleaze, AKA the Hair Metal High Priest, AKA the man with the golden set of pipes and the velvet tongue and most importantly aka diamond david lee roth jr you're looking at right here and the dna testing almost conclusive on that so we will be able to put the stamp of approval on that and put it to bed take one look you can tell that i am the son of glam the front man for the band got a million fans always going out with a bang i'm your ice cream man mr wop bop loo bop wop bam bam hot damn shazam I'm feeling good tonight. Got a good guest for you tonight. That's all I do. I interview legendary guests here. If you don't know what I do, I line them up and we knock them down. Coming to you as always from the Pink Pussycat Lounge, the Den of Sin. Joined by my co-host back there. You might have known him in the Mets days as number 17 over at first base. Guarding the foul line, Mr. Keith Hernandez. He will occasionally chime in with play-by-play and or play the bongo. So, do I have another legendary guest for you tonight? Yes, I do. You are, of course, watching the No Frills podcast. You're watching me invite my guest right now. No Frills, 50-year-old guy here working technology. Can't give you no frills. Sorry, handcuffed. I gives you what I gives you. And that's... Great content, funny conversations, insightful conversations. We get to the bottom of it here. I am, of course, the hardest working man in show business. because I front numerous glam and sleaze metal bands all over the tri-state area, namely Love Sword, which I am still looking for players, by the way. So if you are virtuoso level or higher, please contact me. And, uh... Got a good one for you tonight, man. And I'm excited about this one, man. Hold on tight, pod scum audience. We about to get it on. Hello, sir. Hey, Mark. How's it going, buddy? Good, man. How are you? So good to see you, man. Oh, man. I just was, I was just outside in my garage. I... Uh, Uh, This is, of course, for my audience that may or may not have lived under a rock for a long time. The great Monty Colvin of the Galactic Cowboys, a band that I just have always loved, man. I I look at somebody and I see their face and I just think, wow, they've just written so many kick-ass songs that have touched me, man. You know, I mean, it's so great to, you know, to actually be able to tell somebody that, that just provides you with like, you know, basically parts of the soundtrack of your life. Right on, man. Thank it's it's absolutely amazing to talk to you, man. And uh, I, I've been so excited to do this. And I, I want to tell you right now that uh, when I was out in the garage, the song Someone for Everyone just hits me in a certain way, man. A beautiful song. Really? Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, nice. enough about the music, Monty. Let's get down to the important stuff right here. <laughs> I, I had only gotten a chance to see you one time live in my whole life. And uh, I just want to tell you briefly the story. Uh, so me and my friend, we won tickets. Uh, I live in upstate New York. So we won tickets to a show that would have been, I think it would have been called the Rome. This would have been Rome, New York, the Rome Capitol Theater. And you guys opened for Sabotage. Okay, right. And, uh, and, and I think me and my friend got told to go back and sit in the actual seats because we came up to a very small area between the stage and what would have been an orchestra pit. And we did attempt to mosh. But it was frowned upon very seriously. (laughs) And we were scolded and we were almost like sent to the back of the classroom, you know, like where the bad kids go. Like they may as well just told us to go and sit in the corner. I mean. Right. (laughs) But we did. But we did try. We like to show out and we like to and we like to mosh. All right. Well, we appreciate it. We yeah. Appreciate so, it. yeah. So, so we were there in full support. Now, <laughs> now, when you think of people getting crazy and rowdy at a show like that or or past shows that you played where people mosh and slam dance 
and and get crazy down there. You guys like seeing that when you look out into the crowd? You know, I I was okay with it most of the yeah. time. You know, I I actually like it when people, you know, pay attention to what we're doing though. Right. Right. You know, so I I didn't care one way or the other. I did really enjoy it though when they, you know, I could tell they were really into it. Right, right. And so uh, that was always good. You know, I wanted, you know, I, I didn't like it when, you know, guys would just stand there and look at our fingers. <laughs> <You know? Yeah. laughs> because, you know, it's like, come on, let's let's have a good time. Let's party or whatever. Right, you know? right. But, uh, you know, when they just were banging into each other all the time, that, you know, after a while, you're like, hey, you know, we're up here right Ryan, would you mind right. watching us <laughs> right 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 well i have to say that um uh that you guys you guys were were a, a band that, that it, it seemed like were very hard to pigeonhole as far as the style because you did get put on bills with bands like anthrax and overkill so uh, you think some of it is some of the pet tour packages that you were put on yeah i mean some of those were rough those some of those tours <laughs> were rough yeah. like uh you know the overkill uh tour that was our first tour actually kind of after our album our first album came out and uh man that crowd uh that they, they were rough they they didn't always appreciate the harmony vocals they they, <laughs> they were okay with the thrash parts and stuff like that but when we started singing they would a lot of times turn on us and start flipping us off. And so, uh, that so was you're saying overkill. So you're saying overkill fans, not very receptive to harmonies. Yeah. Yeah. I can see that. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, when we went, when we went to Europe with anthrax, uh, it seems like the Europeans, they just, you know, they were really open-minded to whatever. Yeah. So that was a really good tour. Yeah, I didn't have to work as hard as you in the music business because I'm just a front man extraordinaire that happens to be a, a, a descendant of rock royalty, as you can see, the old man on the wall back there. I mean, you know, <laughs> I'm cut from this. I'm cut from the uh, from the cloth of David Lee Roth. So awesome, man. Yeah. No, I don't know if that really what, is awesome, a, though, Monty. I don't know. <laughs> are you a cousin or something? No, I, listen, I wish I was. I think, uh, well, I don't know. You know, I have a fleet of lawyers working on this, but, you know, who knows? <laughs> i don't know do i look like i don't know do i look like i come from that roth stock it's it's possible it's possible right yeah i mean you got the red goatee you could go around maybe making a case for like you know scotty Inns like younger brother or something yeah. you know <laughs> well I, I am actually dd ramon's cousin that i did so, read somewhere that, I did, yeah. no, that so i've got that in my blood a little bit now, now, how often throughout your throughout your life uh, are you at family things or any kind of functions and ever see cousin Didi? <laughs> well, not anymore because he's dead. But <laughs> I mean, back then, though, I mean, you know, did you have uh, a lot of interactions yeah. with him? <laughs> yeah, I I met him. I met him one time after a Ramon show, and uh, that was kind of strange, but really cool, and I'll yeah. never forget it. But. Uh, you know, I went backstage and they were just like standing around and it was dead silent in there because I think they all hated each other. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> but, you know, Johnny was just standing there like doing nothing. And I was just like, oh my God, I don't know what to do or say. Yeah, but, they were definitely a band that they were definitely a band that you could always feel a certain, uh, a certain uh, attention. That might have been part of what made them great. I mean, you know, quite yeah. honestly. Yeah, but. I, I talked to DD a little bit. He was cool, but uh, yeah, yeah. You know, so do you think now? Now, now, I have read this claim in numerous sources on the internet, and of course, you know, if it's on the internet, you must take it as gospel. It is absolutely one hundred percent true. Of course, I mean, yeah. we know it's not true, so I want to get your take on this. I've read numerous places, and I don't know if any of you guys in the band were ever quoted as saying this, but. Um, do you, you know, do you blame any of the success or the lack of success of you guys not blowing up to where other bands of the nineties, uh, 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 did, and certainly you, certainly the songs were there and you certainly should have, do you feel like, uh, there's a big claim on the internet where people have said that maybe you weren't pushed as hard as Nirvana? Oh, that's definitely true. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when, when they, 
I mean, we were supposed to be like Geffen's next big band. That's what they were telling us, you know. And 1990, they were quoted as saying at Geffen that you were going to be, yes, the next huge thing in music. Yeah. And so that's what they told us. And then, you know, when Nirvana came along, the same guy that signed them had signed us. And they came on, you know, just probably months after us. And, uh, they just turned all their attention to to nirvana and so we were kind of left in the in the wind but uh yeah were you guys ever under the were you guys under uh, uh, ever thinking along the terms of modifying your sound at all where it seemed like so many bands were trying to fit into that huge grunge where all of a sudden the, the microscope was just on bands that sounded like that or or because you guys have always had a sound that's re that's really divided people as far as like you know where to put you and lord knows people want to put somebody in some kind of a genre you know right. i mean right well i i never did i mean some of the guys in the band wanted to go different directions you know and everything and our albums gradually kind of got a little more i guess you'd call them diverse or something you know where they you know, we're all over the place as far as styles and everything. Yeah. But, um, I I really feel like we should have just stuck to what we were doing and uh, just believed in it. And in a way we did, but uh, I don't know. I think everybody started kind of leaning toward like, maybe we should, you know, do this or that to kind of fit in. And right. And when the you pressure start to change the sound. Yeah, when you start doing that, you kind of lose your vision. So I don't know, but we we were always kind of weird anyway. So so in essence, you could kind of say that like if like the record label was like a chick, Nirvana kind of like cock blocked you guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, we got uh, we kind of got pushed aside. And uh, but you know, uh, Metal Blade came along and picked us up, and uh, yeah, we did, uh, I think four more albums for them. Obviously, the uh, the genius that is Brian Slagle, obviously, he saw the power and the impressiveness of the mighty Galactic yeah. Cowboys. Yeah, when no one else wanted us, he was yeah. like, Hey, I, I think you guys are great, and yeah, you know, why don't you sign with us? and but and Brian's we, always kind of been a guy that's been dialed in, though, to the sound that's 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 going on and the sound that's coming on down the road, too. Yeah. You yeah. Know, uh, I'll, I'll always love and appreciate Brian. He, he yeah, uh, he he knows what he likes. Yeah. And he finds it and believes in it. And uh, we really still appreciate what he did for us well another thing that infuriates me and i you know i could play devil's advocate here because this may or may not be true this may or may not have ever even crossed your mind but do you ever think sometimes and this infuriates me if this did have anything to do with any kind of lack of success but do you think sometimes it's getting uh that in that perceived vision or, or that label of not being cool because the Christianity thing bleeds in and people find out that, you, you, you know, that you guys are, you know, Christian guys, but you never really kind of push that in the music. Yeah. I mean, that was never something we, you know, tried to promote ourselves as. But do you think if there's a perception of you guys being a Christian band that it could hurt sales as far as kids not thinking that that's, you know, quote unquote, cool? It. It might have if, you know, if I don't really know if that was ever a thing, though. I If we were right. know that, you know, I it wasn't like our doing, really. Right, right. I mean, we didn't try and hide anything, but, uh, you know, it, it that's possible, you know. But you guys made great music, but there didn't see be any kind of agenda in your music at all of any no. kind. No, we just wanted to be a rock band, uh, you know and just write uh really cool interesting music and that was yes. so the last album was 2017 long way back to the moon and, and i i'd be remiss if i didn't ask this because i'm sure people out there in internet land would want to know since i have you here f five years have come and gone will we ever see an, any a new galactic cowboys album you know i or is I, it the never say never thing yeah <laughs> I'd love to right now. It's just kind of a matter of, 
you know, like how to do it, uh, you know, right. money wise and right. Because it takes money to make those albums, and you know, you can't just really do them for free, right? You ha need to have some kind of way to record it with, you know, uh, a budget or something. And so right now we don't really have that. So, you know, it's something we'd like to do, I think, someday. But whether it'll happen, I, I don't really know. Is it almost impossible right now, in your opinion, though, in the music business, unless you are already wildly successful and you're John Bon Jovi or Justin Bieber or some phenom that takes off? Is it really hard nowadays to, to is it feasible to go out and make a living as a musician and really sustain a good, qual high quality of life? Well, it has been for us over the years. I mean, yeah. it just uh, it, it really is. It's tough. Uh, you know, album sales you know where they go i don't know but <laughs> you know so and people really don't get how much it costs to go on the road you know i mean right that it yes you can make money by touring you know merchandise and and the shows you play you might make a little but you know it costs a lot to be out on the road you know with yes hotels yeah. and just getting from gig to gig so yeah, it, it's tough, and consequently, we haven't, you know, been doing a lot of that. So right, right, and but but so probably people would also want to know is having taken such a long hiatus, how is your relationship with the other guys though? Um, I talked to Dane and Ben quite a bit, um, and we've we've actually talked about hey, we you know we ought to do another show or something, you know, let's right. let's get together and you know, maybe talk about recording some songs or something, but that's, that's about where it is. We're all friends. And, uh, Alan's, uh, you know, Alan's actually playing bass in a cover band now. And okay. so that's what he's doing. And, uh, I don't even know if he'll be interested in, you know, doing any more with us, but, you know, we've talked a little bit about, you know, doing some more stuff. So it's right. always possible. So the possibility is always there. Yeah. Yeah. Something well, you guys like are one of those rare bands that when you go to your Wikipedia page, there isn't a slew of names in the past members column. You know what I mean? Like you guys have maintained, you know, that core group of, have you even had any personnel changes? Didn't Dane leave for a while or an yeah, album or two? Yeah. Dane left through the uh, Metal Blade years and okay. got another guy to replace him. And uh, yeah, just uh, a few shows here and there where, you know, actually, we did one tour without Alan, our drummer. We had a replacement drummer for that. But, uh, you know, Dane's back with us uh, for the last album. And and so, and, he, you know, he's back in the band now. So Right, right, right. We're, we're back to really the original lineup. Right, right. Which I think the fans will, will, would obviously absolutely love that you know i mean I, you know it's it's there's always that sense of nostalgia in all of us where we run a route for the original guys to always be together at least i feel that way as a fan you know i mean yeah. it gets hard it gets hard to swallow that pill of seeing like somebody gone and it's especially hard i think sometimes when a band loses a vocalist because you know the, the sound of someone's voice i mean guitar tones other stuff like that play into it but you know it, it, it's tough not to remember that voice that resonated with you when you first heard a group. You know I mean? When people lose a vocalist, sometimes it gets kind of tough for me as a fan. Yeah. And, and Ben uh, has a very distinct voice. Obviously, uh, you know, all of you guys harmonizing together, you, you know, it's, it's certainly a sound that you guys have crafted together. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, Ben and I's voice together is kind of a, a signature thing for the band. And right. So, yeah. And, you know, we we never wanted to be one of those bands that goes out with one original member and you know, right. still <laughs> yeah, yeah, still we call it yeah. <laughs> like you and Ben get to get you and Ben get together and without the other two guys and call it the Galactic Cowboys reunion. You know, yeah. <laughs> right? Just, yeah, it does feel a little short chain sometimes. Like I thought about that even when Guns N' Roses got back together. I thought, well, it's great that Slash and Axel and Duff can cohabitate together on a stage, man. But what about the other two guys? That Appetite for Destruction lineup was the magic lineup to me. Yeah. I mean, you got to go uh, dig out. You got to go dig out Steven and Izzy then. I mean, you know, to call it a real reunion to me. 
You know, I mean, I, so I want to ask you, though, if you're not making Galactic Cowboys movies, then obviously, you know, it, it's obvious when you're in the arts, you you can just tell by looking at you, you're a guy who likes to create. So now you're creating through artwork. And how long have you been doing the artwork, your paintings? Uh, most of my life. Uh, okay. So, you know, I'll date myself, but you know, like 50 years I've been painting. <laughs> I, 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 I got number 50 coming up next year myself. And so, uh, uh, I, I, I went to, you know, college and got a degree and, right. and, and so, uh, I've, I've been doing it over the years, you know, I've been doing our album covers right. and t-shirts and things like that. And a few years ago, I just decided to, you know, just go full time with it, get a website and just start you know selling paintings and and that's just become you know my way of uh making a living now right and now i have perused the site perused the site excuse me and i have seen a lot of the uh uh a lot of the the, the portraits almost take out a, a, a caricature effect yeah i mean you know i do that kind of thing like uh here let's see i got one uh, you know like this this one beautiful amazing amazing detail you know and and i do that kind of thing but i also do you know realistic stuff um you know in my own style here's a here's a hendrix kind of oh thing oh my god the detail in, in, in the abdominal area is just crazy <laughs> jimmy got some abs yeah jimmy got yeah like jimmy got like uh, uh looks like he got airbrushed by like playboy magazine he looks beautiful <laughs> <laughs> so uh, um so uh, uh, how do you well do you do financially off the paintings i mean do they sell relatively well yeah i mean um it's it's been rough at times because you know our economy you know and whatnot i think has had you know some to do with that right but, uh i you know i've been making a go of it for like a couple of years now and but it can always you know be better and i you know i i've uh i've gotten a lot of you know business from fans and you know people on facebook so forth but uh i'm i'm gonna start getting out and doing like shows like hitting all right you know, right yeah art fairs art festivals uh, yeah things like that getting it out there letting people see it and um uh, Hopefully that's gonna gonna be good. Um, I want to ask. Um, uh, you know, obviously, we, you know, I see a lot of the songs on that I listen to of you guys on Apple Music. You get a lot of the writing credits. Uh, were you the were you the band's main songwriter? And 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 since you guys are such a creative, diverse band, what was the creative process like when Galactic Cowboys gets together? Does someone kind of take the reins, or is it a collaborative effort? Um, I would say I, you know, I don't want to call myself the main songwriter, but I always brought in the most stuff, you okay. know, I always had like, you know, if we were going to get ready for an album, I'd bring in like 30 songs and then, you know, and, but other guys, you know, wanted to write too. And so, uh, you know, they were contributing, uh, you know, it was different ways. Uh, you know, a lot of times, uh, you know, guys would contribute, like Ben would contribute lyrics, uh, you know, sometimes I brought in songs, you know, that were pretty much completed and right. we just them up as a band. So well, I'm fascinated when you're writing songs and you're doing this painting at the same time, um, you know, how, how is it that you're able just to put, put out so much creativity? Like, do you feel creatively inspired? Like the majority of the day, you know I mean? Do you, like writing, painting, creating, are you just one of these guys that's always able to create? Yeah, I, I think it's, you know, for me, it's just a matter of just constantly doing it. You know, yeah. you stay busy. Everything you do isn't going to be, you know, perfect or genius or whatever you just you create a lot of it and you know a lot of times a lot of it's really good and sometimes yeah. something's not so good but right. you just doing it and that that's always been my thing i just i just i'm not afraid to just i, I guess i'm not afraid to fail yeah you know, that's I, key 
I just work at it really hard. And so whether it's, you know, a song or it's a painting, I just right. work really hard every day. Are you, has there ever been a time and, you know, obviously being out and touring, uh, as a working musician, the years in the Galactic Cowboys, uh, you know, being at numerous places all over the world, has there ever been anybody in your, uh, um, in your travels that you've come across in the entertainment field where you've been starstruck? Oh yeah. Um, you know, one of my, you know, uh, heroes early on in my life was Carrie Livgren from Kansas. Okay. Okay. I saw, I saw Kansas, you know, when I was like 18, 19 years old and I ended up meeting him and, and he's like, Oh, I love you guys. And I'm like, what, you know, I, and I was just floored that like, he knew my music. Yeah. And, you know, we ended up playing That's on each crazy. albums and, you know, I got to be friends with somebody that I was just really starstruck by. Yeah. And so, yeah, there's there's people like that, you know, uh, a lot of people that, you know, I didn't know what to say to them. And others, you know, uh, you meet some of your heroes that, you know, aren't that nice, you know, <laughs> you're right. just it, so. Um. Well, you know, the times that you spent out on the road touring, what was road life for you back in the days? Because obviously, you, you know, and, you know, I don't want to make it a focal point of the interview, but obviously, though, uh, you know, you, you do hold yourself, uh, you know, uh, to a high moral code. You know, you're a, you're certainly a Christian man. Um, what were you like out on the road? Like, like, were there temptations? Were there times, you know, when when the music business could become kind of overwhelming? I was never like a party guy anyway. So right. it wasn't like, you know, I never was intrigued by the whole, you know, drugs, Sex, drugs and rock stuff. and roll. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, there's, I guess there's temptation out there. Uh, you know, I was married at the time. So, you know, I tried to be a good boy. Yeah. But, <laughs> you gotta uh, be. I've, that's how you keep a long marriage together. I'm going on yeah. 25 years myself. You know, I mean, you get a good woman to stick by you, man. That's it's what it's about, you know. But uh, yeah, I, you know, really back in the 90s when we were touring, uh, it was pretty boring. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there were no, you know, we didn't have laptops or cell phones. Right. And plus you're opening for bands like Anthrax and Overkill, which is not really known for bringing in the chicks, you know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Dudes, you know, we did a dream theater tour. Yeah. And, you know, and like I, I tell my girlfriend now, it's like, you know, it was mostly guys. Yeah. You know, yeah. Fingers. And then, you know, it's like, yep. it was pretty boring. You know, you sit on the bus all day just waiting to play for, you know, an hour and then right. you're on to the next town. And it's not quite as glamorous as, you know, people think sometimes. So I got to ask you this. When you guys pop up in Airheads in 1994, did you get your SAG card for that? Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Yeah, we made a little money, you know, as actors. Yeah. That's pretty every, crazy, though. Uh, every now and then, if it plays on cable, I still get like $5 or something. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah, I got that going for me. So... I read somewhere and, and I certainly, this resonated with me because I had the same upbringing, but um, then I read somewhere, I saw an interview where you had very strict Christian parents growing up, correct? Yeah. And you sometimes had to sneak, sneak listening to some of the music that you liked. I also was in the same boat where I grew up in um, uh, what is now perceived online as uh, now is classified as a cult. But we didn't do anything weird. This wasn't like David Koresh, Jim Jones type stuff. It was more kind of akin to uh, um, uh, kind of celebrating holy days and, and living more by the rules of like the Old Testament, like Jews, you know, so it, it paralleled a lot of that. Um, and uh, so not celebrating Christmas and a lot of stuff like that. Um, so so listening to what I wanted to listen to was a big, big roadblock for me when I was little. I imagine you went through the same thing. Oh yeah. And for a while I actually was in a cult and, uh, that was weird, but, uh, yeah, you know, <laughs> my folks really great 
people and they they always mine too mine too they always meant well but yeah growing up they were like no rock and roll in the house same here and yep. so yeah when i when i was in high school you know my friends would you know give me the eight tracks and the, <laughs> you know the who's next yeah uh, that album um you know some of that stuff the first like you know uh early rush stuff you know all the world's a stage and i was like smuggling that in my backpack in you know and when they weren't were home, you ever caught were you ever caught with the goods did your parents ever catch you with music that they didn't approve of um well my dad actually heard me listening to elton john one time under headphones oh he goodness was, not, the, not elton <laughs> on and i'm i'm like sorry you know and but yeah even even elton john back then you know was considered you know a no-no but he finally reached the point where he's like you know you're old enough now do what you want and right so immediately you well know, i look back i look back on it now and and i guess my parents especially my father was a little bit hypocritical man because i do remember there wasn't a lack of music in our house i think it was more just whatever the message behind the music was because i think stuff like you know elvis and motown and stuff like that was certainly acceptable because i do remember hearing it but you know i mean come on you're gonna tell me that people that these people aren't out there sinning too i mean you know absolutely it's just yeah. the guys that i'm listening to are sinners and their music's just a little heavier and louder <laughs> you know yeah. i mean <laughs> uh, yeah my folks were listening to you know that you know frank sinatra right right it wasn't for a lack or, of music i guess it was just about what my dad i remember my dad a couple of times man like when he did find me with albums and it's so laughable looking back on the albums now like he wanted to open up the gatefold and inspect the lyric inspect the lyric the lyrics on uh and i think i was like 13 or 14 to bon jovi's slippery when wet i'm like dad these are all like songs that appeal to like chicks these are like love songs and like you know uh -huh. power ballads you know i mean yeah i mean you know the weird thing was that my dad he wouldn't let me listen to anything growing up but when i finally got signed i played him uh a song off the first galactic cowboy album he he hadn't heard any of our stuff. Right. And when we, we did this four part harmony at the end of the song called My School, mm -hmm. he heard that. He just went, Oh man, that is great. That is going to, that is going to go, man. And he became like our biggest fan and ended up doing our merchandise, handling our merchandise. And he was like the biggest fan we ever had. And, uh, He'd That's even, great that he came full circle like that, though. Yeah, and he'd That's even cool. He'd even stay up on Saturday Night Live or Saturday Night and tape uh, Headbangers Ball just to nice. see on there. Nice, nice, Dad. Yeah, he was awesome. Uh, but what was the reaction like of your parents if you rewind a little bit when you're telling them that you're gonna? First of all, I, I, how how did you actually did you teach yourself guitar? Pretty much, yeah. I had like. And, and how did you get around that? How did you get a guitar into the house and able to play it? I mean, were, were your parents aware that you you were, you would took up the instrument? Yeah, they. In fact, yeah, he he had always told me like early when I was a little kid that if I ever wanted to play, he'd buy me a guitar. And so I, you know, when I got to like 16, 17 years old, and I was like, okay, I'm ready for that guitar, and he actually. <laughs> held up his end of the deal and bought me a guitar. I don't think he thought that's what I was going to do with it. Right. You know, right. But, uh, you know, and, and it did, you know, bother them at first, you know, to hear that stuff coming out of my room. Right. Oh, you know, gradually they just accepted it that that's, you know, what I love to play and do. Yeah. And, and, uh, but then, you know, when, when we got signed you know it was just like oh this is awesome you that's know? great that's a good ending that's a good ending to the story though you know yes yeah. I, I mean especially when you're saying that he's working the merch table and he's taping headbangers ball i mean he really came full circle i mean that's you know oh man like the funniest thing he ever said was i was talking to him on the phone one day and he goes have you heard this uh motorhead uh <laughs> and i'm like yeah, 
and he goes, man, you know, if you're going to do that stuff, that's the way you do it, man. Yeah. Yeah. So you could almost, so you could almost make a case that your dad might've started to slip into being a full on headbanger. On yeah. Head. He was on his way. I think. He was on his way. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you know, uh, to talk to me a little bit about, you know, you guys have done tours with a lot of bands, but you seem to have a pretty special relationship with the band Kings X. Can you, can you talk about that a little bit? Like, uh, you know, you guys have done a lot of work with them, correct? You know, we did a lot of tours. I, I met Doug and those guys when I was in college. Yeah, the great that, Doug Pinnock, who has been through his own ordeals with his own health problems as well. Yeah. And We're always I, wishing him well. Sure. And and I was like best friends with Doug when I was in college. And we hung out all the time. And, and uh, I ended up moving to Houston. They were down there. Uh, and... It's a long story, but, you know, we ended up with the same management and we did several tours with them and, you know, they were just really good friends of ours. And I, you know, they're great guys are a great band. I didn't realize we were going to have our entire career or like 30 years later, still, you know, every time you, you hear of you know, Galactic Cowboys, it's immediately followed by King's Act. A lot, it is, yeah. You no, know, and it's kind of like, I don't think they'd want to be, you know, compared to us forever. Right, so, right. You know, in fairness, it's like, you know, it's it's been kind of a, a thing where it's like, you know, we love those guys and it's, you know, all that, we appreciate them, respect them. But, you know, it's like we wanted to be recognized for for us and for our music. And we wanted to be, you know, thought of as doing our own thing, not just always compared to, to King's X. And so right. it's not a, it's not a bad thing. You know, it, it, it's a compliment. At right. the same time, it's like, you know, after a while, it, it's gotten a little bit old. Right, right. Um, well, you guys certainly, certainly had, you know, what a lot of people would call a, a very devoted cult following at the very least. But, um, you know, going back to those, the aforementioned early 90 days, uh, do you ever look back on it and, you know, not to beat a dead horse, but do you ever look back on those days at all with s sour grapes about thinking about like what could have been, or are you really in a good place with it though? Because, I'm pissed that you guys didn't get the push that you should have got. Yeah, it's it's both. It's disappointing that, you know, we didn't have more success um, because I think we had all the ingredients there. No doubt. Yeah. And, you know, it just it didn't happen like we thought it would. But at the same time, we got to make like seven albums and tour the world and we got to be on mtv and we got to do a movie and it hasn't I, been a bad life yeah. yeah i mean we got to do so many things that i appreciate and yeah that, uh, you know we're a real blessing so you know it's it's a little of both i mean i'm i look back and you know it's it's tough sometimes to think about because it's like oh man it could have been it could have been so great, you know. Hey, or, hey, but Monty, let's look at it this way, though. Kurt Cobain or any of the guys in Nirvana were never in an Adam Sandler movie. That's right. <laughs> you know? I mean, come on. We got to look on the bright side here. Like, you got your SAG card. Now, what did the old man think when you got the SAG card and saw and he, so he sees you up there in a the movie? That had to tickle him pink, right? Yeah, he he was a little disappointed in the movie, he said. <laughs> He thought the movie could have been a little better, but... Uh. Yeah, well, you know, that's that Adam Sandler brand of humor, though. It's kind of goofy, you know. I think he was sure. even goofier back then, because that's, that's what, 90, 94? That's a long time ago. Yeah. 1994, I think, Airheads came yeah. out. So that's all. God, man, we're making ourselves look old. We're dating ourselves here. <laughs> so, so... um. If you yourself were getting dropped on a desert island tomorrow, do you got that one album that you would just have to take with you if you had to listen to it over and over for the rest of your life? Are you going to say that Kansas album that meant so much to you? Um, I hate to just give you one, Monty. You're such a creative guy, man. But if I'm yeah. dropping you out of the airplane with one damn album, I mean. That's tough. It'd probably be something by the Wild Hearts, maybe. That's yeah. my favorite. 
that's my favorite band. Okay. So I'd probably take, you know, maybe uh, Earth vs. the Wild Hearts or something like that. That, you know, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I, I, that's I, one I, of those. That's one of those tough gun to your head questions. You know, it, there's so much great music out there. Yeah, and I get bored really fast with the same thing over yeah. and over. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what kind of what kind of joy does creating? Um, you know, obviously, you, you know, when you create music and you write a song, you can kind of hear, you can kind of, you know, exude that joy, on, you know, through your instrument, through your stage performance, but. Talk about painting a little bit. What kind of joy does that give you? Like being in a room, quiet, painting, or I don't know, maybe listen to music or whatever, man. But, you know, it's such an internal internal way of creating. You know, it's just kind of you and your paints and your canvas. I mean, like, you know, how do you get joy out of that? I think I get the most joy by seeing it develop, you know? Okay, yeah. Out and, you know, a lot of times I'm going, this is – this looks really ugly. They go through these ugly stages and then all of a sudden, <laughs> yeah. suddenly it starts coming together. And then I, you know, and then I work till I, I don't have any more decisions left on it. And I, I'm like happy with it. And it's, it's a really, it's a really cool feeling. Yeah. To step yeah. back and look at the finished product. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of like sitting back and, and listening to the song when it's, you know, it, it starts off as, you know, maybe you just sitting there with a guitar, but then you hear everything with the production and everything. And it, you know, it's a very satisfying feeling, you know, and at times you might hear something that you wish you would have changed or right, right. look at the painting and think, well, you know, it's not as good as something else I've done, but I'm still proud of it. You know? Right. Right. So, so, you know, obviously I mentioned earlier about being on the site, looking through the paintings. Um, but if people were to want a piece of art from you, you know, are you somebody that like they could submit something or make a request to you and you would paint that for them? Yeah, absolutely. I, I do that uh, quite a bit too. You know, people, you know, want me to paint their, you know, a, a portrait of their dog or their family or right. Whatever. Right. Yeah, I do that. Uh, a lot of people, you know, have asked me to paint like a rock star that, you know, that I haven't done yet and I'll do it specifically for them. And so, yeah, I'm always open to commissions. And now I'm curious about this now, now, you know, I, I usually by nature, you know, uh, the people that watch my podcast, especially will know that I do tend to have a lot of hard rock slash heavy metal thrash guys on here a lot. But my favorite artist of all time is Prince. Have you ever been commissioned to do a Prince one or have you done a Prince one? I both. Both. I, okay. A guy commissioned me to do one and and yeah, and it's uh I I actually uh now have Prince. Uh Prince of Prince. <laughs> <laughs> That's, great. That's a great way to yeah. advertise it too, Prince of Prince. Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah, if if there's al or there's uh, paintings that uh, I've sold already, you can still get a print of them on my website, Monty. That's Call. cool. That's cool to know. And uh, yeah, so uh, I got all that on there. I've got the original paintings uh, of a lot of stuff on there too. So, okay, so let's really get down to the brass tacks here. Now, is that beard red? Is that Kansas City Chiefs red? Is that why the beard is red? It's football season. Yeah. Yeah, it's absolutely Chiefs red. Okay, because uh, I see the also, I see the poster in the background. I'm seeing yeah. all the signs on the wall. Yeah, I'm a big Mahomes guy. Are you okay? Okay, I I, I myself am over here in upstate New York, a long suffering. You know what? I shouldn't say a long suffering New York Giants fan though, because you know Eli did deliver us two Super Bowls in in one decade. So I mean, that's you know. Yeah. It hasn't been terrible. I mean, 07 and 2012 is the last time we won. So we are coming up on 10 years here without a Super Bowl, but. Right. Well, hang in there. It, it'll it come around eventually. It'll come around. Is, is, is this going to be the Chiefs year this year? I hope so. You know, I you never know, but uh, they're looking pretty good so far. Now, what made you a Chiefs fan? Uh, are you originally from that area? Um. I grew up in Phoenix, Arizona, where we didn't have a team at the time. Right. Okay. But I, I ended up moving to Missouri in the 70s. 
Okay. And I started rooting for the Chiefs literally in the to mid seventies, and I suffered through all those years of some lean ones. Yeah. And then we got Patrick Mahomes, and everything changed. And so we've we've had a lot of fun the last few years. So okay, fair enough, fair enough. Okay, now listen, man, because you are such an enigmatic, affable, lovable guy. And I only do this with the guests that come on here that do fit that description. I'm going to have to throw you, Monty Colvin, into the pod scum furnace. Okay. Okay. Now, these are just a list of comparison questions. You will be graded on it. We'll go over the answers, but just give me the first answer, okay, that comes to your mind. Okay. Okay. Uh, the better Christian, and I don't mean Christian as far as like religion, the better Christian, Bale or Slater? Who? Christian Bale, Christian Slater. Oh, I gotcha. The better Christian. Uh, Christians, uh, I guess Slater. Okay, you're more of a fan of Christian Slater. Uh, the better band that's that has their name based off of a location, Chicago or Boston? Boston. Really? Boston guy, huh? Yeah, I, I, I love Boston. They're man. a great band. They really are a great band. Okay, uh, out of the Manning Brothers, Eli or Peyton? Peyton. Okay. Hilarious. Yeah, I, I just watched the two of them do Monday Night Football. You got to watch it on ESPN, too. Just they commentate. They're great yeah. together. Great I can show. listen to them all day. They should have a TV show. Okay, yeah. the better song that has a color in it, Crimson and Clover or Yellow Brick Road? Wow. I like you weren't the way... allowed to listen to Yellow Brick Road. <laughs> right. I, I, I love the way Joan Jett did Crims Crimson and Clover, so... Okay, so you'll take that version of it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Here's another quarterback one for you since it's football season. Joe Montana or Elway in the two minute drive? I'll go Montana. He played for the Chiefs. I think you have to. Uh, the wor are, are you a baseball fan? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, so what's the crappier? Uh, or, well, I, I don't want to sound hom homophobic, but both of these I think teeter on sounding a little. Eh, but what's the worst one? Uh, Manny Ramirez's nickname of Man Ram or Randy Johnson, the big unit. I think they're both pretty, uh, you know, I don't know. Which one's worse? Yeah, which one would you rather not have? Man Ram's pretty bad. <laughs> that is. Maybe I'll go Man Ram. Yeah, because being the big unit, though, you can actually walk around, and that's a nice, that, yeah, that's that's a nice claim cool. to be able to make, you know? <laughs> okay, now it's going to get tougher right here. Uh, I, and I know you like your prog rock. Uh, Pink Floyd or Rush? Rush. You, you didn't even think about that. Uh, yeah. The better band with a biblical name, Genesis or Exodus? You're a prog rock guy. I know you're going to take Genesis, right? Uh, I got an Exodus we, shirt on today, though, for what it's worth. Yeah. I am rocking. Well, early, early Genesis. Uh, right. Oh, uh, not the later Genesis. Okay. You know, fair enough. Topic. Fair enough. Okay. Uh, so now that we're speaking about Genesis, uh, Peter Gabriel or Collins? Gabriel. You're a Gabriel guy. Okay. Um, and, and now here's one you should answer as a as a, as a bassist. Uh, who's the better rhythm section? John Paul Jones and Bonham or Moon and Entwistle? Moon and Entwistle all the way. All right. I'm going to check off that you got that one right when we go back to correct. And of course, Obviously, given who you're talking to, what's the better Van Halen era, Hagar or Roth? I'm going to go Roth. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Monty. That makes you're me welcome. feel good. I mean, come on, man. Okay, so I'm looking back over the answers, and I don't really have a problem with any of them, man. But I want to know, like, I I, you, I usually try to pick one out to discuss. Uh, so why Moon and Entwistle? I, I mean, you know, make your case. Uh, Moon is my favorite drummer of all time. Okay. Okay. So he's your guy. He's your his whistle, his tone, and that dude was a beast. A be okay. Okay. And, and let's not and let's not disparage the low end of John Paul Jones and Bonham, who certainly you know. I've never been a, a Zeppelin fan. No. You, no. No. You know what? I'm. I'm. I, I, my dad tried to get me into him too, and I couldn't get into him. I was more happy that he got me into the Rolling Stones. Sure. You know that made me much, much, much happier. So. Yeah. All right, so you know, in closing here, I just you know, I think the fans are 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 just probably really curious though. You know, we talked earlier about the Galactic Cowboys. You said never say never about new music from them. But what about you personally, musically? Any musical endeavors? 
projects, anything going on? Nothing musical right now. Uh, I've got my solo stuff, you know, crunchy, uh, but I, it's been a long time since I've, I've done any shows. I'd like to do some of that again someday though, yeah. but uh, it's mainly just full on art right now. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Now, were you a big fan of any of those, uh, any of those aforementioned earlier in the interview, any of those grunge bands? I was, I was curious to get your take on some of those, uh, Seattle bands and if any of them, cause you were kind of gaining your popularity. We talked about the, you know, the conflict with getting Nirvana, getting pushed a little bit more, you know, you guys were on the same label or whatever, but did any of those bands taking Nirvana out of the equation? Did you like any of those other bands? Uh, Alice in Chains. Yeah, me too. That's my, that, yeah, that's my favorite yeah. vocalist ever. I love Lane. Yeah. I mean, I liked Nirvana uh, for a while and then I just, you know, got so uh, burned on it, you know. Just Although I will say that I am happy that Mark Lanigan, before he passed away, the great singer of the Screaming Trees, did leave us his audio audio book of his memoirs, which is fantastic reading. I will say it again. Anytime I can plug it. It's just fantastic to hear Mark Lanigan telling his life story. He somehow morphed into a very Tom Waits-ish you know, type of voice as he got older, very throaty, gravelly, you know, it, 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 it's got that smoky whiskey kind of, you know, tone to it. Right. I'll have to I can sit there and listen to him read all goddamn day. I love it. I mean, the, the, the guy's got, it's, I, I listen to him narrate the phone book. It's amazing. Yeah. I heard that guy from, uh, uh, behemoth talking about that. He loves, he loves that guy's music. So it's just, yeah, it's just crazy. So, all right, so you know, I guess we'll leave it on a on a, on an you know on an up in the air tone. If we'll get new Galactic Cowboys, stay tuned, right? I mean, you bet. Hopefully so. Never say never. I mean, you got fans out here that certainly will always be here. You know, waiting for it. Can I change one thing? Sure. <laughs> can, I, can I go backwards and say Christian Bale? I'm gonna. Wow, say that was the that was the one that stuck in your craw, Monty, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I, I got to thinking about that. and Are you afraid of going against him because he's Batman? Yeah, a little bit. He's a little scary. He is a little scary. I, I, I watched something on YouTube the other day. You know, you go down these rabbit holes on YouTube, and I watched this video, like a 10-minute video of um of them talking about very difficult actors to work with in Hollywood. And he's always up there in the top of oh, the list. Oh, yeah, I, I can imagine. But, but I love that about him, though. That makes me like him even more. Yeah, what a genius. I mean, his acting is incredible. So I, I definitely got to change my answer on that. Okay, fair enough. You know what? I think now that I'm I, I'm looking at that, that's probably the one I should have that, that, that I should have took an umbrage with. I should have left you alone on the on the end twistle and moon one. I mean, you know, the, I think the more I'm looking at moon and end twistle, uh, you know, I'm just glad we both agreed on neither one of us would want to be called man ram. <laughs> you know, that meant a lot yeah. to me that you did that yeah. you <laughs> you know that yeah. you'd be happier being called the big unit. I'm gonna sleep. I'm gonna sleep better tonight, like knowing that that, that you didn't want to be Man Ram. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but listen, brother, it was so great talking to you, man. Uh, we'll we'll keep in touch. Hopefully, we can do this again sometime, man. You bet, Mark. This is yeah. A Thanks, man. Yeah, and listen, go Giants, man. Boo Chiefs. <laughs> ah. <laughs> but I love the red beard, brother. I do. I, you know, it suits you. You wear it well, my friend. You wear it well. <laughs> it was good talking to you, man. Appreciate you being so generous with your time, man. Thank you so much, buddy. No problem, Mark. Thank All you. All right. Talk to you later, sir. Thank you. See ya. See ya. Oh, now we get to watch Monty log off. See, I don't edit anything, Monty. Now the world's going to see you using uh, your technology. Still here. <laughs> Monty can't get rid of us. <laughs> Do you want me to go away? Not, well, you know what? Listen, man, I, you know, I'm f almost 50 years old. I don't know how to edit anything, man. So I just leave it and then I, I wait for you to disconnect and then I talk really horrible about you. Okay. No, okay. I don't do that. I promise. Scout's right. on. Well, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> never, yeah. never, buddy. Never. All right, man. Later, man. <laughs> Later. There he is. Your friend, my friend, the great Monty Colvin of the galactic cowboys and boy if you missed the boat on them you fucked up seriously go back and listen to their diverse beautiful majestic catalog of music by the galactic cowboys again that is monty colvin 
And I hope you guys liked that episode. If you didn't. <laughs> so until next time, my pod scum minions, remember to take it easy and keep it sleazy.